dedicated to Henry Farman. In the years of the primal war, the war of Good afternoon, good evening, good whatever, good whomever, good however I may find you. This is Alan Averill. This is Agitators Anonymous. I am just a singer in a heavy metal band trying to make some sense of the things I do not understand, which is most things. And as promised last week, um, this episode is going to be about the Haitian Revolution, about the man they called the Black Napoleon, the Black Spartacus. Black Spartacus, what an incredibly amazing name that is if there's any uh, doom stone or sludge bands who wish to steal it um feel free feel free you are very welcome um i'm not sure if you're going to actually be listening to agitators anonymous if you are in a sludge band who knows perhaps you are um but this is episode 170 something or other in the grand scheme of things does that make this um are we now a teenage podcast are we approaching middle age i don't really know um, it's certainly clear that most podcasts don't seem to last more than um, a handful of episodes. So this puts me ahead of um, Harry and Meghan, I guess, to have reached the grand old age of 174 or 175. Although the remuneration with which I'm receiving is slightly less distinct. The Haitian Revolution. Why do I want to talk about the Haitian Revolution? Well, A, it's absolutely fucking fascinating. It is so interesting. Um, but also that the themes around the new Primordial album, um, the uh, the themes of revolution, of rebellion, of resistance, the idea that there are doomed romantic nationalist heroes in all our pasts who um, helped set the structures of the society that we live in that we may have forgotten. I've talked about Joseph Plunkett before, um, all that kind of stuff. But this man, Toussaint L'Overture, you must excuse my French pronunciation, I'm getting excited. Toussaint L'Overture um, is an incredible figure and going to be mainly the topic of this particular podcast. But as I said, um, how it ends, you know, the figure on the front of the new primordial album. I am originally a farmer. It's a picture, uh, a poster from the 1920s. But this idea of this revolutionary figure um, with his pistol at hand. And it just got me thinking a lot, a lot about these sort of doomed figures who, let's be honest, in the grand scheme of history, in the grand scheme of things, we can see the incredible breadth and foresight of some of the things they were doing and the righteousness with which they were trying to establish um, the rights of man, so to speak, or all these kind of things, or resist empire and colony, resist authority. And what better place to really um, have a podcast then, or to begin a podcast with this incredible man, Toussaint L'Overture, as I said, um, and the Haitian Revolution. So before I do get into the Haitian Revolution, and please remember, I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band. I'm not a, uh, you know, I'm not a history teacher. I'm not a, I'm not, well, I'm not lots of things. I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band. So I will butcher, no doubt, some of the pronunciations, probably some of the, I've got, um, my whole, in front of me here is just a, a panoply, um, could that be the right word, of notes of random scribbles. And as anybody who's seen my handwriting, they will know um, that you need some sort of um, special, special code to break that key, but I'm going to do my best to try and tell the story of the Haitian Revolution and set it in the context of, um, there's going to be some dark stuff in the context of slavery, in the context of the 18th century, in the context of uh, colony and empire, and all this kind of stuff. Um, because most of us have a, have an image now of um, Haiti, I suppose, a post-earthquake um, image of an incredibly uh, poor and violent, war-torn sort of island. Um, and I think for me, at least, it was um, in the, the one of the first things I knew about Haiti was um, back in the day when that movie, The Serpent and the Rainbow, came out. Maybe you don't know that. It's a 1980s horror movie. It's based around um, Haitian voodoo, voodoo dust, so to speak. You'll know that song from The Devil's Blood. Um, but that Serpent and the Rainbow, that, the Caribbean voodoo that inspired um, Papa Doc Duvalier, um, you know... Uh, is absolutely fascinating and probably worth a podcast in its own right. But that was the first moment I really became sort of aware of uh, Haiti and its sort of religious practices, which are fascinating. They do play a small part. Um, they do play a part in this story, but I'm not going to get too bogged down in all that kind of stuff, even though 
It is absolutely uh, fascinating. But we're going to talk about revolution. We're going to talk about rebellion. Um, and one of the first countries to manage to claim uh, independence, if not the first, um, from colonialism and empire, abolishing slavery and all that kind of thing. But before I get there, before I get there, I'm tripping over myself to get to the story. Um, I should say the podcast as ever is sponsored by Metal Braid Records and the label of the new um, of Primordial for many, many years. If you want to go back and um, actually, if you want to order the new album, you can do that. Um, but anyway, you can go to Indie Merch dot com slash metal blade records and get 10% off your order if you're out there looking for a backdrop could be for anything maybe you're an aspiring tattooist and you need a little backdrop for behind your um convention appearances um who knows what you're doing but maybe you need a properly fireproof backdrop slide into my dms pull up to the bumper and um let me know and we can facilitate it as you can hear my voice is a bit shredded we've been rehearsing the new primordial songs on the 15th which is a Friday, we play McHugh's in Drogheda. Um, Drogheda is a glamorous um, outpost of, um, it's sort of about an hour north of County Dublin. They call it the Venice of the North. It has many similarities to, um, you know, to, to a beautiful um, Roman um, architectural city. <coughs> but yes, on Friday the 15th, and we will be playing new songs. So try and show up to that in Drogheda, McHugh's. There's something unusual, I must add. And the first album from Metal Blade Records actually was The Gathering Wilderness. And a friend of mine on my Patreon. Oh, yeah, I forgot to mention that I have a Patreon. It's slash Alan Averill. You can go over there and there's all sorts of interesting things happening, interesting discussions. There is, um, you know, there is unreleased songs. There's demos. There's all extra podcasts, all sorts of stuff. And there's no tears because I can't figure it out. So. Alan Averill. Um, and someone said to me, oh, you know, you want to hear what they're talking about. They're saying that um, The Gathering Wilderness, this first promotional album, is this big album about anti-immigration. And you find every time you release an album, more and more people, or, you know, when you do something that's more in there, um, your name bubbles up to the surface, more and more people complain and whinge and bitch about you. And I don't really pay any attention. I don't read forums. I don't read reviews. Um, and I just thought it was fascinating that they were reinterpreting the message of The Gathering Wilderness um, to me, to, as some sort of anti-immigration sort of thing. Actually, this the title, The Gathering Wilderness, is stolen from Leonard Cohen. <laughs> it's um, one of the songs of Songs of love and, love and Hate. The wilderness is gathering all its children in. That's where it was robbed from. And really, really, the, uh, the message of the album was about how we were moving further and further away from um, Earth-based spirituality, actually. Um, I'm here. You could just ask me, what does the gathering wilderness mean? Rather, instead of, um, you know, gossiping on forums, saying that I'm, you know, dog whistling and gaslighting and whatever all these other nonsense words are. I'm here. I'm alive for the time being. Um, you could just ask me, what does the gathering wilderness mean? And I could explain it to you. But chances are that would make you adjacent to someone else. And you might say, well, you're not telling me the truth. Of course, what you're saying is what you're saying is actually what I'm saying is what I'm saying. And that's what the Gathering Wilderness is about. And the title is taken from Leonard Cohen. Anyway, there you go. Let's get into this. The Haitian Revolution. The Haitian, let's paint a little bit of a picture about ha Haiti. Um, you know, you can go on Google Maps now and have a look where it is. Um, it's in the Caribbean. And back in the day, in the 18th century, it was one of the richest, the richest um, islands in this whole region. It was the center of a huge uh, slave trade. It was, um, there was huge gold deposits, coffee, indigo, sugar, and 60% of the world's coffee at this time, let's say in the, um, let's say 1770 or so, was coming from Haiti. 40% of Britain's sugar was coming from Haiti. So this was one of the most important um, trading posts in the Caribbean. And that's what sets it so incredible, it sets the story so, um, so, it's such an incredible story when you actually really, really get into it. But um, the population at the time, we're talking about 17, let's say 1770s, um, 550,000, which was about 500,000 slaves. And then a sort of um, upper class, what did they call them? The, the Grand Blanc. And then um, the Afranchis, who were, um, I suppose, the sort of mulatto class is what they called them. I'm not sure you're supposed to use that word anymore, but um, we are talking about something from the 1770s here. Um, and they ruled over a huge population um, of slaves. And um, to set this in context of where the world is at the moment, um, there is a, how can we say... 
There was still monarchical rule. We are, um, you know, before, we're 30, 40 years before the Industrial Revolution, but there is something looming on the horizon called the French Revolution. There is something fermenting within society in that um, working class people, in that slaves, in that this sort of underclass of society are beginning to um, revolt. We're, we've moved past sort of 17th century, um, you know, middle age, middle aged Politi- politics, whatever those might be, um, and we're, we're the society is beginning to, re- I suppose, resemble some of the more civilized, and I use that word very, very loosely, elements that we have today. And um, the French Revolution ends up playing a huge part in this story. But let's go back to. Um, I digress. I digress. I'm getting excited because I want to get the story out there. Our hero called Toussaint Louverture, who, in the grand scheme of history, um, can really be defined as having um, a very broad and informed view of the society that um, was going to come after him. But they called him the Black Napoleon um, at the time. But he's a kind of true rebel. But he um, he became ruler of a society that basically had enslaved him previously. He actually had a plantation. He had, he had some slaves himself. But I think he's widely considered one of the greatest and the most unsung black revolutionaries of history. Now, Porto Prince, actually Haiti at this time is called Saint Dumas. Um, our hero was born in ni- uh, 1741, and he really only came to prominence um, at the age of 50, which is quite incredible when you really think about it. At the time, um, life expectancy of a slave on Saint Dumas was 21 years old. Can you imagine the darkness and the grim, the grim life that people had? Um, but um, Toussaint, he had learned French. At this time, in 1776, um, he had been granted his own freedom and he had opened, he'd um, begun a plantation of his own. He'd had slaves of his own. And at 1791, 1791, and that's an important date. Actually, 1789 is, is a very important date, but 1791, he's age 50. And news of the French Revolution in 1789, the, the radical revolution that changed the nature of our history, was beginning to um, really disseminate amongst the population of saint Domingue. And 1791 is kind of one of the most important uh, moments in the history of Haiti, I think. There is, thing, there is this thing called the Declaration of the Rights of Man, which is enshrined in the French Revolution, basically declaring all men equal. Um, it's, you know, it's obviously a little bit vague on how this affects slavery and women and all sorts of stuff, but that's the fundamental principle. And it, it began to um, gestate, began to move through society it, in an incredible way. And like I said, it reached saint um, it reached Haiti. And, and on August the 14th, 1791, there was an uprising in Haiti. Um, slaves um, rose up against their slave owners, um, there was incredible bloodshed, incredible brutality. And so the story goes, there was a huge voodoo ceremony. Um, and the uh, witch doctor of the time proclaimed that this is what they needed to do. There needed to be this mass uprising. And the slaves started revolting, killing their masters. There was hanging, there was bloodshed, there was massacres. Oh, I mean, the history of Haiti... I mean, I, you know, there's this primordial song, No Nation on This Earth, which is kind of really written about things like this, where it's like, tell me what nation on this earth is not born of tragedy. And of course, it was written, I suppose, with Ireland in mind, but it was really written about all small nations who suffered at the hands of colony and empire. And you really have to put place um, this Haitian uprising um, in the context of the time. I mean, we're still talking about the age of slavery, the age of colony, the age of empire. But you ask, where is Toussaint? Where is this this hero of the time, um, or the leader of the moment? And he had shipped his um, he had, the Dominican Republic is also is the other side of the island of Haiti, and he had shipped his family there. He had shipped the um, the white slave owners who had freed him off to America, and sort of prepared himself for taking center stage in this um, dramatic, bloody theater that was unfolding before him. And so the the white um, the white colonizers they retreated to the south of the island, um, leaving Toussaint leading this army. First, he had six hundred soldiers under his command, and this swelled to four thousand soldiers as his. Um, his sort of um, his ability in the battlefield began to be noticed and it was clear that he became this sort of de facto ruler this de facto leader um, and 
So to put this in some sort of context, um, uh, the post post French revolutionary um, Europe, um, both the Spanish and the English saw the um, the French as weak at this moment, and they decided uh, to also uh, send military to Haiti to attack um, Haiti or to occupy areas of Haiti. Because don't forget, the Dominican Republic was called San Domingo, which was in Spanish Spanish control. And there's no way that at the time the Spanish were um, going to try and abolish slavery. In fact, they were, you know, they were very much part of that um, exercise. So Toussaint fought this kind of bloody civil war against the French and he fought them um, he fought them literally to a standstill. He, he, he literally defeated the French on their parts of the island that, um, that they were fighting on. They retreated the sort of the, uh, his army occupied the mountains and then slowly took city by city, as I said, making the um, white section of society retreat to the sort of southern area of the island. Like I said, I'm not a history teacher. I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band. But, but you know the phrase, my enemy's enemy is my friend and all that kind of stuff so he fought the french um to um basically to a standstill did a deal with the spanish right did a deal with the spanish because he saw the french now as particularly weak and the spanish thought well we can do a deal with this guy um did a deal with the spanish then changed tack when the slaves were forced by the french forced by the french freed by the spanish now, now let me try and put a little bit of context on that in 1793, the kind of new French Republic, the um, the radicals within the new French Republic government freed, they abolished slavery in all French territories. So like I said, the Spanish and the English were trying to sort of take advantage of this in their colonial territories. Louverture, Toussaint, he, um, he did a deal with the, he did a deal with the Spanish, um, seeing that the French were weak. And when the French uh, freed the slaves. He rode down from the mountains with his army and basically then attacked the Spanish, slayed the Spanish, and then allied with the post-slavery -free freed um, French. Uh, it's quite complicated. And I'm pretty sure I just butchered that explanation. Let me try and um, reframe that. Prior to the French freeing the slaves in 1993, 1793, prior to that, um, him and his army were fighting the French, um, fought them uh, literally to defeat. Then um, when the French, uh, news came through that the French had um, abolished slavery, he'd done a deal um, He prior to that with the Spanish because, you know, he's my, your enemy's enemy is your friend and all that kind of stuff. When the news came through of the abolishment of slavery, he then attacked the Spanish we could say, kicked their ass in a very bloody, bloody way. And um, English forces were retreating to various areas of the Dominican Republic, as I understand the history to be. Um, so then he allied again, once again, with the French, who kind of thought, well, you know, we don't really have much of a choice here. It's either that or the whole thing is going to end pretty poorly for us. There was also um, uh, a Polish contingent there. Quite what they were doing there, I don't really now know. So then he attacked the British. So even though I butchered that explanation um, and, he, and beat them. So basically this revolutionary army in Haiti fought the French, Spanish and the British. Think about that. Actually fought three colonial powers um, and removed them from the island of Haiti, more or less, and declared independence. Um, it's really quite staggering, quite incredible when you think about it on those terms. And the only, the only, um, um, the only colony to do so. And here is where some of his, um, I think, his sort of greatness appears from, or some of his, you know, the kind of um, the mythology that surrounds the man, is that after fighting um, Haiti to um, to independence, there was no reprisals. He didn't go after him and his army. Didn't go after the um, plantation owners. Didn't go over the small but white minority who were left there. Um, the idea was to have reconciliation. The idea was to invite the plantation owners back to the land so as to keep crops moving. Um, and he instituted a concept of colorblindness. There were new laws. Workers received wages for two years um, working on the plantations. And the idea was they would be freed after that. And this is why he kind of appears as this um, very 
um, this sort of statesman, uh, which is a word that you don't get often used back then, especially considering um, the sort of humble origins of where he's come from um, and the bloody civil war that had preceded this, you would imagine that retribution would have been on the mind of almost every single um, every single ruler who came to power in such a way. But this is what he tried to resist, as if he had some sort of knowledge of the next one, 200 years that were going to befall, um, going to befall Haiti. But he also has this sergeant or this general called Jean-Jacques de Salon. Again, I'm going to ruin these French pronunciations. Who was like his his iron fist, like his bloody right hand man who went in and just like, you know, murdered and massacred um, in the south um, and brought the French under heel and all that kind of thing. And he'll let, he'll kind of become important um, in the next couple of years because he will sort of gain control over the situation and install himself as a military dictator. But also from the other side, the truth is, I suppose, um, well, not the truth. I mean, I'm just looking back over the history books and that kind of thing, is that many of the people who'd been freed um, from slavery, then found themselves working back on the plantations, paid meagre wages. And there was an awful lot of the, the, this, the uh, sort of relatively altruistic, you could say, society that um, Toussaint envisaged, envisaged didn't really come to pass um, completely. Of course, the gains, the political gains, the um, the concept of freedom itself and emancipation are absolutely incredible things. But he also did some very odd things um i think it was a case of um i think you know but freedom in name he also installed himself as a kind of dictator for life but at the same time you have the americans coming in he also kind of gave the americans a bit of a shove off in the next or the haiti did in the next you know 50 to 100 years which is quite incredible they kind of sort of staved off four different um um, empirical colonial nations who had aspirations of taking over and this sort of rich land but they, the Americans at the time, started to blockade Haiti. So they couldn't export what they were exporting before, even though they were now fundamentally free. And the sort of fabric of a trading society began to fall apart to some degree. And in 1799, I think at the end of this, um, this sort of, the, uh, this new reign, um, Jean-Jacques de Salanque went down to the southern uh, white outposts in what was called the War of Knives, that was a good name for a band, literally massacred thousands and thousands of people, men, women and children, leaving literally um, no imprint of the, uh, the slave owners left on the island. A friend of mine actually got a job in Haiti um, sometime in the maybe 20 years ago um, as a, how could I explain this properly? Sometimes they, sometimes uh, the UN um, would hire sort of like unmarked mercenaries or whatever you would say to go and um, protect their troops and he said that he uh, went there and just said it was absolutely absolutely insane they just it, the country seems to have this uh, incredible and this incredible history but also this it's so steeped in violence this moment of independence that it seems like it's uh, unable to um, escape escape this, um, the die was cast, historically the die was cast, and it seems incredibly sad because it, by the, from the outside looking in, it looks like some sort of a paradise island, you could say, and so rich in natural resources and minerals. But anyway, I'm rambling now. 1799, 1799, a man called Bonaparte took over France, the Bonapartists. Um, and this is where things begin to um, change a little bit. There's a civil war. Napoleon um, takes control once again over France and he wants to reinstate slavery. He wants to roll back the abolition in 1793 that the radicals um, had proposed. Um, you know, the, the, the reign of terror, the Robespierre type characters. Um, he wants to roll that back. And so he sends a military convoy out to Haiti to um, basically install themselves once again. And he declares that colonies must return to French rule. Initially, Louverture, Toussaint, he swears allegiance to French, maybe no to France, maybe knowing which way the wind is blowing. But he had in 1801, um, our boy Toussaint, um, he had invaded San 
Santa Domingo, um, which is uh, the Dominican Republic, which is beside Haiti. He invaded that and abolished slavery. And one of the terms, one of the terms uh, the Bonap- that Bonaparte had demanded was that um, under no circumstances, even though um, Toussaint had declared um, allegiance to French and this new uh, Bonapartist um, government, one of the things that he had been forced to agree was that under no circumstances was he to invade Santa um, Domingo and again abolish slavery or you know um, oppose Spanish rule there and so for a while the island is um, united I suppose you could say and so you can imagine it one day um, you know maybe somebody's in the port and they see looming over the horizon French military ships um, and Toussaint, who'd already defeated the French, defeated the Spanish, defeated the English, tried to muster support to fight the French once again. Um, and it seems like he couldn't. It seems like, and he seemed to know that the writing was on the wall, despite being the first um, colonial um, outpost that had managed to declare its own independence. He couldn't muster a fighting army to uh, fight the French. Slowly but surely, all elements of society moved over towards French rule. Um and a society that, despite being considered, um, you know, racially colorblind in name or one of the visions that he had for society, didn't see itself as that, didn't see itself as equal. And I suppose because of the blockade was somewhat of a failed state or a failing state. In the end, in the end, sadly, uh, everyone turned on him, including his general, his general, um, who uh, let me turn the page. What was this guy's goddamn name again? You can hear the pages turning. Um, Our boy Jean-Jacques. That's him, that's him. Jean-Jacques. He was basically installed as a some form of military dictator um, who swore allegiance to the French, which sort of set, in we, in, he set the wheels in motion for, I think, um, many, many of the things that ended up becoming uh, true in the 20th century. Like I said, you go back to... Um, uh, Papa Doc and Baby Doc Duvalier and again this sort of military dictatorship they seem to have been that die seems to have been cast um, in the uh, in the 18 well in the turn of the 19th century 1800 1801 so with everybody turning on him Toussaint could see the writing was on the wall he turned in his arms under the promise that slavery would not return and retired he retired to his farm um, thinking that maybe he'd be able to live out his days of course, he was then invited to a meeting with a French general. Um, I think, in a way, he had to know this was a trap. He was entrapped. He was um, he was sent sent into exile in France. Um, uh, a man called Leclerc seems to have lied to him, um, and on his deathbed, with yellow fever, um, he wishes to reinstate slavery on the island. There was also a Polish legion on the island. Poles, what were they doing there? Hmm, well, maybe that's another story. However, Toussaint is captured and departed. He's sent to the sent to France, and he's sent to it seems out of spite the Durer Mountains, one of the coldest areas of the whole of France, and is just literally sent to rot in exile somewhere in um, a prison cell. And on his deathbed, de Klerk, the man who had um, lied to him reinstalls slavery on the island and in 1803 um, Toussaint dies alone in exile in France strangely enough it has echoes of what happened to Napoleon himself dying in exile exile among the ruins yes um, it's it has strange echoes um, they have resonance uh, have there's a resonance with how these guys both ended their lives in exile but in 1803, there is a French-British war, and um, it seems like the um, upholding of the military outposts in Haiti. And um, there's no real, um, there's not enough soldiers. There's no real will for that to keep on happening, um, as yeah, attention is diverted elsewhere. I suppose, in some similar way, you could say that in um, during the ri- uprising, during the rising in Ireland in 1916, you could say that. Um, the powers that be also were had their attention diverted to what was happening in the First World War. Otherwise, um, could it have achieved its success? It's very hard to say, but the chances are probably not. 
Um, and that's often the way history goes sometimes. Sometimes advantageous moments are based upon um, happenings hundreds, if not thousands of miles away. Like I said, Dessalon, who was um, Toussaint's general, his iron fist, um, there is a brutal war on the island and almost all of the uh, whites on the island are killed. And in 1804, Haitian, Haiti, um, which is the, um, they rename the country Haiti, declares its independence, which is really quite, I mean, the whole story I've done, I've probably butchered it there, um, pun intended. Um, I probably butchered it there, but it just became so fascinating to me when I was making this new Primordial album, these ideas, these sort of um, resistance and revolutionary movements throughout the smaller nations in the earth. Um, those ones that have resisted empire and colony and the sort of the, the, these unsung heroes become um, who were doomed maybe from the very start. And in the breath of history, you can see how doomed they were. But their ideals or the things that they gave their lives for seem to live on. And in this respect, it seems like an, an incredible visionary that he was, um, Toussaint, because the idea that you would gain independence of your country in such a brutal way, having literally um, become the first um, new nation that was um, born out of slave rebellion and owned by slaves, to then um, say, well, we're going to have and we're going to install laws based on reconciliation, um, not reprisal, I think is quite incredible. Now, of course, in the fullness of time, you realize that it didn't quite happen like that. But this idea of sort of trying to create a colorblind um, statutes, colorblind society has echoes that you can see in, um, you know, Martin Luther King in his famous speeches and all that kind of thing. You can see why Toussaint became um, a sort of inspiring figure to elements of the Black Lives Matter movement as well. Because of the simple fact that here is a man who came from nothing, came from humble beginnings, um, and literally took on all of the great empires of the world at the time and f defeated them all in order to claim independence. It's a story that is singular only to the uh, island of Haiti in this respect. But it does make you wonder if having um, the, the formation of your society forged in such incredible bloodshed and such incredible violence, if um, this had sort of formed... A historical trajectory that the island never quite really managed to get off. Of course, there's you have to mix in natural disasters. We've all heard of the earthquake. There's hurricanes. There's all sorts of other things that have ravaged the country. But it's clear probably that um, in back rooms um, in many, many places in London, in Paris, in um, Washington or something or other, there were moves against this early Haitian independent state against the island, against its ability to export and import goods. And there were tariffs placed on the island. And you could probably say that the island's um, poverty um, of the following 100, 150 years was probably linked directly to that rebellion. Now, maybe that's a jump to make. I'm not really too sure. Um, but it would seem that almost Haiti was um, ahead of its time, a precursor to the, um, the you know, emancipation laws and the end of slavery, but a very bloody, violent precursor that sort of um, made Haiti into some sort of testing ground, some sort of experiment for the next 100, 200 years that you can still look at. Um, I don't know if any of you probably watch some of those, um, I guess they're called like Indigo Traveler or those, and those guys on YouTube, those YouTube um, um, men and women who go to all sorts of um, crazy parts of the world and um, just just basically are sort of like, they don't call it dark tourism. Um, I'm not sure I believe that Netflix series. But certainly they go to war-torn, poor, ravaged countries in the world and try and show you some of what life is like there. And if you've watched some of the ones from Haiti, it seems like a very violent and lawless place altogether. Um I was only, I've never been in the Caribbean. I've been in Honduras um, in a moment where um, they literally told us when we were at the hotel, like, you cannot leave. You can't go to the 
uh, corner to buy, um, you know, whatever it is you want to buy, cigarettes or alcohol or whatever it is you're going to buy. You just can't go anywhere. And um, there was dudes with guns on every street corner you saw. Um, every now and again, a military truck would go past and, you know, just guys with machine guns everywhere. Everywhere was graffiti, a sort of anti, Western anti-imperialist graffiti, which seems fair enough if you know the history of Central America. But <clears throat> it certainly seemed a lawless and reckless and wild place to be that at any moment you got the feeling could descend into um, into violence. And if that country is reasonably stable compared to Haiti, then one can only imagine what it's like um, in Porto Prince. I don't know if I have any listeners in Haiti, do I? I certainly have some listeners in some um, interesting and curious places because you can see the statistics. I think one time when I was particularly bored in lockdown, I went through uh, the list of the top 40. That must have been an exciting episode for people for people to listen to me going in at number 27, um, blah, blah, blah. But being fascinated by numbers and statistics, it wasn't hard to see why <laughs> someone who uh, is probably, you know, uh, well, let's just call me obsessed by numbers, would be, want to do that as a podcast. But it seems that Haiti, um, for being this daring uh, kind of country, kind of paid the price for some of that um, in economic ways. But it doesn't change the fact that um, Toussaint L'Overture, the man they called the Black Spartacus, like I said, what an incredible name that is, the Black Napoleon. Um, it's a it's a story that not enough people know. It's a fascinating story. This is a man who came from humble origins to the age of 50, um, took over an army, um, fought the French, fought the British, fought the Spanish, gave the Americans a bit of a shove. Well, he was dead by then, but his country did. Um, and was uh, declared independence in the face of um, colony and empire, abolished slavery. Slaves rose to um, take control of their own land. It's an inspiring and absolutely incredible story. And my voice is about to go. Um, maybe, Alan, you should just stop talking for a day. My friends, I hope I didn't butcher the story too much. And I hope it inspires you to go and take a look at the Haitian Revolution um, and as I said, the new Primordial album, How It Ends, is kind of inspired a bit by uh, people like this guy, the guys who resist authority, resist empire, resist colony, and people are in the far-flung corners of the earth. Um, the underdogs, the underdogs, my friends. Right, I hope I didn't butcher it too much. Like I said, I'm just a singer in a heavy metal band. And these are the things that fascinate me. I don't. Who knows what next week is going to be about? Anyway, the Haitian Revolution, um, the Black Napoleon, Toussaint Louverture. We salute you on episode 174. Is it 175? I don't know. Anyway, we salute you. <laughs>